So good afternoon and welcome to our joint workshop between the National University of Political Science and Public um, Administration in Romania and the Central European University in Hungary. So as you probably know, today our research, uh, our research team will present the preliminary results of the project, the pilot study on mapping the attitudes towards um, COVID-19 vaccination in online communities. And um, this uh, pilot study was um, uh, set out as a means to build a methodological framework that allows public conversation mapping using uh, technology driven um, for social sciences related projects. And um, the project was coordinated by Professor Alina Bergoano, Dean of College of Communication and Public Relations, NSFA, together with two other team members from Central European University, Eva Bogna from C Center for Media, Data, and Society, and Judith Stakac from um, uh, also from Center for Media, Data, and um, Society. As you, uh, as we said, the aim of the project was to create, to test to validate uh, a methodological framework that will help us analyze public conversation on COVID-19 vaccines on Facebook in this cross-national research project between Romania and Hungary. So as I said, uh, the, um, as you probably know, the meeting will be recorded and uh, the discussion will be promoted to the professors and students from both universities, from CNSPA and Central European University. Also, if any questions, please, you can write them in the chat or address them during the Q&A part. We will have uh, two Q&A uh, sections today. And um, moving along to uh, our session, I will introduce uh, Professor Alina Borgawano, Dean of College of Communication and Public Relations, NSPA, and Project Coordinator. Professor Alina Borgawano is a Romanian scholar with strong interest in digital transformation, identifying and analyzing this information. She is currently a member of the advisory board of the European Digital Media Observatory and an affiliate member of the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats. Professor Alina Borgoano will open our discussion with a few remarks about the project and the context of this study. So please. Thank you very much, Catalina. Let me greet uh, all of you, the project team members and uh, our esteemed colleagues who took their time in order to, uh, to attend our event. Uh, first of all, let me express my personal and also my institutional gratitude, if I can say so, for the project Civica, which presents a great opportunity to put our resources together our intellectual resources, our financial resources, in order to contribute to the transnationalization, internationalization of our universities. So I, I was very interest, interested in this uh, project, even if the funding is rel relatively small. As the title of the project indicates, we are talking about, about a pilot project. And I deeply hope that uh, the pilot project will have a follow-up because I think there is a great need in to reflect on uh, this kind of uh, social phenomena and processes. And with this, I'll go to the second part of my introductory remarks. I think that it is high time in the universities, in the intellectual environments, to reflect seriously and to reflect evidence-based as much as possible on what has happened since the, the COVID-19 pandemic began. I think that uh, with a very gross generalization, if you allow me, I think that we have grossly underestimated the magnitude of this event and the fact the consequences of this event. Uh, we somehow had to get used to it in our personal capacity as parents, as family members, as employees, as decision makers. And I think and in this exercise of getting used to it, I think that we have grossly underestimated, again, its scale and also its consequences, whether we talk about the social consequences, health consequences, political and geopolitical consequences. So in this context, I think that it is really a huge need to reflect on what the pandemic meant. 
And uh, I'm very, very glad that this very, very small project uh, represents uh, in Romania at least some sort of a starting point in order to reflect on what the pandemic and the vaccination has meant, have meant for the Romanian society. Uh, I deeply hope that again, uh, this pilot project will follow up in order to come up with evidence about what has happened, why it has Has happened and what could uh, going to the third uh, part of my presentation of my introductory remarks, I will make some references to what we start to understand about the pandemic. I think that we start to understand that the COVID pandemic was not a medical crisis, was not a health crisis, but even if we consider it so. I think that the COVID pandemic was, of course, a health crisis, a medical crisis, but it was primarily a political and a geopolitical event. I think that this is what we grossly underestimated when we dealt with the pandemic, when we dealt the with the vaccination, we considered this as health-related phenomena. And of course, they are health-related phenomena, but they were much more than that. They were primarily, as I have told you, socio-political and as you could see, geopolitical phenomena. The second point is that we start to understand, I think, of course, these are, it is a combination between personal observation and reading a lot about what uh, starts to be as serious studies about the pandemic. So the second thing you, to, to understand about the pandemic is that it reflected a widespread anti-establishment feeling. Again, I think what was underestimated by those in charge with dealing with the pandemic and man managing the vaccination campaigns all over the world was the force, the strength, the extraction of this anti-establishment feeling. My uh, intuition or my, my hypothesis for my whole reflection about the pandemic is that the success of the disinformation campaigns uh, uh, centering on doctors had at its core this anti-establishment feeling and the art of the disinformation campaigns during the, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic was to portray the doctors, the scientists, the medical profession and the scientific profession as being part of the establishment, as being, as being part of the system. I think that was, we, ha we have to, we have to, mm, <laughs> I am, uh, not uh, inspired, but I have to admit that uh, the, this kind of portray portrayal of doctors, scholars as being part of the system, as being sold to the system, as being paid by the system, uh, provided the, uh, the contributed to the success of the disinformation campaign. So the anti-establishment feeling which preceded the pandemic and the portrayal of the, of the medical profession and of the scientific profession as being part of the system. The third thing that we start to understand more clearly related to the COVID-19 pandemic was that it was a transnational phenomena. It was the first in, true instance of globalization whereas the responses were national at best. I think that one of the reasons for why the pandemic uh, led to so many deaths and so many social uh, uh, catastrophes, economic disaster, was that uh, again, we, we dealt with a transnational of the conspiracies of the um, theories of uh, conspiracy theories were transnational, circulated at a transnational level, whereas the response were national at, at best when this response existed in the first place. So that was the, the third point that the pan COVID pandemic uh, revealed was this kind of inconsistency between the transnational character of the phenomena and the national local response of a national character of the political or of the social response. And the
We lost the connection? Yeah. <laughs> when I started to talk about the conspiracy theories, of course, there was a conspiracy to stop me, to take me off the grid. So again, I think that the first strong point that we should reflect on was that kind of discrepancy between a transnational phenomena by nature, I mean, objectively transnational, and the fact that the human response, social, political response was national. And the fourth point that I would like to make in, uh, in the context of these introductory remarks is that we still do not know what is happening in the public space, especially what is happening in online communities. Uh, we still do not know what is the relationship between social media and mainstream media, how content from one sphere fly, uh, flows to, to the other one, uh, what are the viralization mechanisms, how algorithms function, how they can be studied. So I think that how social media function still represents a huge black, black box, which has to do with our lack of intellectual tools, probably of, of lack of technological tools. It also has to do with the fact that social media continue to be very, very opaque. So from this uh, point of view, I think that uh, our project, even if it is a very small project, whether even if it is a pilot project, I think that it, it greatly contributes to this discussion in, in as much as it touches on the content on this inconsistency between this tension between globalization and local responses, the anti-establishment feeling, how, how attitudes are formed in, in, under these circumstances. And the second contribution that the pilot project makes is that it sheds light upon how, how uh, social uh, media can be studied. And also I think that our project uh, shows that the tools that are available right now are not enough. So I think that the biggest contribution of the project is to show that we do not know how to study the phenomena, which may sound a little bit paradoxical, but I think it is uh, really a great contribution. I watched follow, I watched very closely the discussions about the limits of the tool that we have used. And again, I truly believe this is very honest on my behalf that this is the biggest contribution of the project to show that the, we still lack the technological, the intellectual and the methodological tools to understand what is going on. Uh, thank you very much. I am addressing the team members for the huge efforts that you invested in this very small project. And uh, thank you to our guest uh, speakers who again found time to uh, uh, find who found time in order to get engaged into our conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alina Bergawano, for your remarks and insights around this topic and uh, the study. For a further discussion, I will invite uh, our guest speaker, Dan Sultanescu. Dan Sultanescu is a political scientist with a PhD in communication. He is the research director and founder of a research center at Senesetea, Romania. He has published several articles and books on themes related to the relationship between trust in Western actors and compliance with public health guidance or the effects of conspiracy theories on the increase of populist attitudes. So Dan Sultanescu, our guest speaker, will continue the discussion. And I will announce that right after his intervention, we will have a small Q&A part. So if you have any questions, you can prepare them for our guest speaker or for our project coordinator. So Dan Sultanescu. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, congratulations for this uh, project. Uh, I think it's a, a great uh, first step in, uh, in order to combine new methodologies um, uh, that uh, right now are available for us uh, social scientists in order to first collect large amount of data and second to uh, create uh, uh, um, new models of understanding our uh, reality. I will uh, try to share screen uh, because I want to uh, share with you um, a presentation that I have uh, regarding um, recent research that we've done. Uh, um, thank, thank you for the introductory. I am um, uh, the research director of um, 
Romanian think tank that for the last seven years tries to combine this type of uh, new technologies um, in order to evaluate uh, threats uh, that appears uh, with uh, um, new media uh, and that affects uh, civic participation and democracy uh, in uh, Romania, but not only in Romania, in, in our region. And uh, in these uh, years, um, <clears throat> for seven years now, right, like I said, uh, uh, we started a little to, to see how, how complex this work is and uh, try to uh, implement things that other um, think tanks in the West, and especially in the United States, uh, you know, are, are using um, to combine um, social science with data science uh, in order to um, have a better understanding of, uh, of the world. And uh, what happened in the last few years uh, with all these phenomena like uh, COVID pandemic uh, and uh, um, the vaccinations challenges and uh, this year, last year, uh, with the, the uh, war in Ukraine and all the threats that uh, are uh, again affecting our region, um, these type of instruments are much more relevant than ever uh, because uh, this can help us uh, doing quicker research and uh, much more uh, um, efficient research because it's uh, it's uh, it's not only dependent on classic method of research but uh, also for gave us access to uh, real data um, instruments. Um, and uh, I just want to share with you some of uh, our activities in the last few years. Um, showing not only the results of our work, but uh, uh, the methodologies that we try to implement in our activities. And uh, like I said, this is, could be a very good introductory to um, um, listening and presenting the results of this project, uh, because I'm very, very interested to see how these new methods are uh, used uh, um, for, for this uh, Civica project uh, for a very, very complicated topic like uh, the effect of, um, um, let's just say not only misinformation, but all the hoax that uh, um, are surrounded, surrounds the vaccination process in Romania. Uh, so like I said, the, our center, it's a, it's a center that tries to bring together uh, it tries to bring together uh, very different uh, type of experts from different areas. And uh, this is an effort that uh, we know that must be um, um, extended to all the efforts that social scientists are trying to, to, uh, to uh, for all the social scientists, scientists that tries to <clears throat> incorporate um, data science methods in, the, in their work. And um, uh, usually in the last few years, uh, classic, we use classic research like surveys in order to understand the evolution of a different type of topics. And uh, this classic research cannot be uh, abandoned because the classic research is the, uh, it's still very, very efficient and it's still very, very reliable. Uh, but this the type of classic research can be uh, completed by uh, new instruments like uh, open source the instruments or other type of instruments and I will just show you an example with uh, a very simple <laughs> and uh, underrated instrument uh, which is Google Trends uh, that can uh, provide every researcher and every person uh, real-time data about um, um, people's interest in uh, topics and this topic uh, this type of data can complement uh, data from surveys uh, in real time and uh, can uh, help you uh, do one of the most important things uh, that you must do when you are working with big data to reduce the noise and understand the re the real issues uh, putting aside all the noise that you are uh, uh, bombarded with uh, from the uh, online and uh, social media. And uh, 
Uh, your topic is regarding uh, vaccination. And here is a, a very simple graph that uh, I made just minutes before this presentation uh, using Google Trends uh, to show us how in the last two years in Romania, uh, the interest uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, COVID pandemic and also the vaccination uh, developed. And uh, you can see with the blue line, the interest, uh, search interest regarding the pandemic with uh, an obvious uh, high point in March 2020 when the pandemic started. And uh, uh, with uh, the red line, you can see the interest regarding the vaccination uh, with uh, these uh, few uh, interesting points that are related to uh, the public debate in Romania and also the waves of uh, vaccination. And uh, these type of instruments can uh, give you uh, relevant uh, information about when the moments are, um, uh, uh, when some, uh, some uh, events are much more important than others and uh, so on. You can um, add to this type of information data from other type of sources like uh, uh, from crowd angle uh, data regarding Facebook uh, activities. And uh, we are fortunate enough, I don't know for how long, to, to have access to Facebook data via crowd angle, which is a platform that currently provides data for uh, journalists and researchers. And uh, you can collect, like you can see here, hundreds of thousands of uh, posts regarding some topics. And uh, uh, then only depends on the capability of creating a model of understanding these uh, large amounts of data and uh, some technical abilities to uh, use uh, advanced uh, research methods. And this is an effort that uh, uh, I, I think you are doing right now and uh, I applaud you for the, doing this because this is an effort that uh, uh, is not done very often. Uh, most of the people are afraid of uh, using data from online uh, for obvious reasons, because there are a lot of limits, uh, limits from the platforms, limits from the platform that allows you to collect data and limits uh, for all the instruments that uh, uh, we can use, all the algorithms we can use to, to analyze data. But um, I, I, I believe that it's better to start working with uh, these type of instruments sooner rather than later, even though they are they have a lot of limits. Knowing the limits and accepting the limits, we can uh, improve our uh, our research. Um, I also want to uh, share with you um, uh, a very simple uh, um, information regarding the research that we've done in 2020 during the pandemic year. Uh, when uh, uh, using a combination of uh, survey data and online data, we try to see if there is a connection between how people are behaving and accepting health uh, guidance from the authorities and uh, the conspiracies and uh, um, anti-Western attitudes that they uh, could have uh, in relation to that. And our hypothesis was that people that uh, are anti-Western and are listening to conspiracy beliefs uh, are less willing to uh, comply with uh, health regulations. And uh, people that have correct knowledge about the pandemic and are concerned about the pandemic will have uh, better compliance with the uh, regulations. And that was a uh, research before uh, the vaccination year. Uh, but I think uh, we didn't uh, measure this. We should measure this uh, uh, soon. Uh, but I think this type of connection uh, could apply uh, to the vaccination issue as well. Uh, people that are have correct knowledge about, um, and, and right now I'm doing new hypothesis, people that have uh, correct knowledge about uh, vaccination and are concerned about COVID uh, probably are more likely to comply with uh, the recommendation of for vaccination and people that are having conspiracy beliefs and uh, uh, do not trust the West or even trust uh, uh, or Russia in our case, uh, 
uh, will uh, uh, have less, will have a lower predisposition uh, willingness to, to, to comply with this regulation. Uh, in our, our research and our hypothesis in 2020 uh, has been confirmed by the results. So um, I, I think that uh, this could be a good step for a, a classic research for the future. Um, I will, uh, I don't know if you have, I can have five more minutes to show you a little more about a different type of research that we can do using this, uh, big data and uh, uh, tools from uh, uh, data science. Uh, beyond uh, classic research, there are a lot of uh, instruments that uh, uh, comes from using very um, uh, simple but more efficient uh, Boolean search queries in order to limit the noise and uh, uh, correctly extract the data that you need uh, for some specific topics. And then uh, with uh, these uh, new data mining instruments that you uh, all of us uh, have access to, uh, even though we don't have coding capabilities, we have access to instruments that can extract data for us. Uh, and then you can uh, monitor subjects. And here is an, uh, uh, are the results about the topic that uh, we work at our center uh, um, uh, in 2021, uh, when we monitor the increase of online conversation about uh, populism in, uh, in Romania, tracking more than 20 uh, different topics, uh, for uh, more than one year and uh, seeing unfortunately that uh, the anti-western feeling in Romania is increasing a little uh, right now we still uh, have um, two-thirds of the population that are pro-western but the, the minority that it's anti-west it's growing and uh, the current events uh, are not helping and uh, the emergence of uh, populist voices and the populist pages can be monitored uh, using uh, data from Facebook, uh, for example. Uh, you can uh, uh, extract data for using CrowdTangle to, to see what are the most populist voices in Romania. And you can even use uh, much more complex algorithms like uh, cluster algorithms or uh, network analysis algorithms to uh, see the relationship between pages and groups that are sharing some type of content. And uh, this type of analysis uh, can create powerful visualizations like these ones or these ones. So, uh, we, I, I, I will not uh, explain uh, most of them, but uh, and the visualization part is one another uh, one uh, very important part of this type of work uh, because uh, working with large amounts of data uh, <laughs> is not uh, sometimes the visualization can help you better understand the relationship between the parts of uh, the data that you are uh, analyzing more than the coefficients and the statistical coefficient that you are. Uh, uh, you have access to. Now, one other part that is very, very important um, uh, that I want to share with you is uh, related to the effort of cleaning the data. Now, cleaning the data is something that uh, it's not very sexy to talk about, but it's, uh, I think, um, uh, takes most of the time of the research in this type of field. Uh, it takes, I think, in my opinion, more than a half of the time uh, to, to understand the data that you have and clean the data and prepare the data for analysis. The analysis is very quick and very fun to do, but in order to uh, reach the point where you can do the analysis, you have to prepare the data. And this is a, a, a very huge effort. And uh, Every researcher that wants to, to um, do some things in this area needs to know uh, needs to know that. And um, I think I will uh, stop uh, in uh, here with uh, just uh, explaining this uh, last uh, slide, uh, which is a slide related to some recent activities that uh, we are involved in. Uh, being uh, right now, I'm uh, in the United States with a Fulbright uh, uh, scholarship, um, working with. Uh, 
social media lab uh, at the University of South Carolina, and uh, we are helping them collecting data for uh, uh, UNESCO. Uh, UNESCO in February will organize a um, uh, conference uh, regarding regulation of internet. And uh, in, for that, uh, they need to see the evolution of uh, global conversation in the last 10 years about fake news, misinformation, hate speech, freedom of expression, and other relevant uh, topics related to that. Uh, because uh, um, understanding how some conversation are evolving uh, can, uh, can uh, give you data about what are the topics that needs to be addressed more uh, urgently uh, compared to others? And uh, you can see, for example, here that uh, the, conver the global conversation regarding fake news was initially very high uh, in the world, especially after the US elections in 2016, uh, but and uh, had another peak during the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, but there is another combination of terms, uh, misinformation and disinformation, which are much more precise terms uh, that had uh, somehow replaced the conversation uh, um, about fake news. In the last few years, the conversation about misinformation and disinformation increased a lot. Uh, with a lot of, uh, th there are a lot of explanations to that. Uh, but uh, it's an interesting uh, approach to to have for for some topics, uh, not only to go in depth and see the connections and uh, I don't know cluster analysis, network analysis, or other type of, of, of very specific analysis, but also to to, from, uh, to take a step back and look at the bigger picture and uh, in order to see the dynamics of a, a subject compared to 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 others. And um, I will. Uh, uh, end my uh, presentation with uh, uh, a list of uh, objectives that we have, uh, not only for our center, but, our, uh, but also for our university uh, to uh, do more in order to combine uh, social science uh, instruments and uh, capabilities with uh, data science and computer science, because I think we can create data hubs and uh, uh, a lot of new resources for uh, public policies, uh, for education, and also for the uh, civil society that uh, wants to, to be engaged in um, promoting and defending the values that we are promoting and defending. And uh, I will uh, stop my uh, presentation right now. And uh, if there are any questions, we can discuss them by now or uh, later. I don't know how the moderators are. Uh, Thank proposed. you. Thank you, Dan Sultanescu, for presenting the results and uh, of your studies and also the options that we have uh, when analyzing public uh, discourse. As I said, we have a small Q&A part now. So if any questions from our participants, you can ask them now for our guest speaker. and. Uh, the inside. Uh, I've seen I've seen Roxana that raised her hand. I think she applauded. No. <laughs> okay. So, if any questions, please. Uh, take into consideration that this is an effort. Uh, what I wanted to show you uh, is how. Um, uh, how many, uh, um, the fact that there are a lot of options uh, in doing this type of research, and there are a lot of sources for data in doing this type, of, and not only data, but also uh, um, analytic resources. Uh, the thing that I didn't enhance uh, um, underline very, very much uh, is the fact that Okay, you have the data, we have a lot of algorithms, we have a lot of resources. What we need is uh, the correct knowledge about the field that we are studying. And this is not coming from data. This is coming from our experience. This is coming from our theoretical expertise. And this is coming from working with people that uh, knows the field. It doesn't matter if you are um, researching a topic that uh, gives you a lot of data if you don't know what to do with that data. And this is a problem usually that uh, affects a lot 
people that are have very good technical capabilities. I had this type of conversation with people from technical uh, universities, and we want to explore new ways of uh, working together with people from technical universities from Romania and uh, from Europe. And they told me that they also need a connection with social scientists because social scientists can give them the framework and the capability, the, the explanation for why some things are happening. So uh, uh, this is something that uh, you need to, to have uh, in mind as well. Yes, uh, very interesting. Also, you mentioned cleaning the data, which I was thinking about researchers that you probably need to train in a certain way that they have to, they should have a certain experience. And uh, if you can have, uh, describe probably a little more, how do you, what do you do or how, what tools you use or um, what are the steps that you take when it comes to cleaning the data and preparing data for being? For I, I, can, I can give you one example because this, this is a very, very large conversation about any type of uh, analysis that you are doing. Uh, for example, if you are searching for a topic, uh, I don't know, you are searching about the vaccination, you, you cannot search only about one word. You need to search about a large combination of words, and then you need to, ex in order to include a lot of data, and then you need to have cri good criteria to, to uh, exclude some of the data that you collected that uh, could, uh, could mislead you, because the, even though they had the words that you are looking for, they are not referring to the topic that you are looking for. And uh, this is a, a, a classic example of uh, cleaning. Then there are some technical aspects of cleaning, because uh, in order to do uh, um, good uh, statistic analysis on some type of data, the data must be similar, look, uh, look alike to, 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 to be similar. And the people that work with Excel sheets know what I'm talking about. Uh, you cannot simply have uh, I don't know, a list of uh, posts uh, and uh, ask an algorithm to do something about that list of posts. This is the thing that probably will come in the future and uh, not probably, definitely will come in the future because right now there are a lot of uh, tools that helps instrument um, uh, scientists to ask via, um, I don't know, an online assistant like Siri or others to do some type of analysis for them. But this is the future, it's not the present. Um, so before that, you need to clean the data. You need to have the same type of con content in the uh, columns. And you need to, uh, um, when you have numerical data, uh, uh, you have to be sure that you have numerical data for all the columns and, and so on. These are type of examples that can show you that this is a very boring uh, type of activity, but it's essential. Otherwise, uh, all algorithms uh, that you are running uh, are going to give you results. But if the data is not clean properly, the results could be flawed. Thank you. Thank you. If any questions to our guest speaker? If not, I think we can continue. And uh, once again, thank you, Dan Sultanescu, for presenting your insights on this topic. And for the following part we, of our workshop, I will introduce our team members to Julia. Do you want to ask? Um, okay. Hello. Uh, one question for Dan Sultanescu. Um, among the um, tools you have presented, uh, which um, how many are free, uh, free of charge? I mean, open to the public, and uh, how many are? Uh, it's, a good, it's a very good question. Uh, there are only two free. Uh, one is uh, Google Trends, which obviously everybody has access to it. And uh, I encourage every person to use it because it's much more powerful than it seems like. And uh, the other one, I think uh, it's uh, CrowdTangle, which is uh, you can have access to it uh, through two ways. First, uh, uh, if you are part of a research team that has access to a CrowdTangle platform, which is a platform that uh, give, uh, is giving access to journalists or researchers to 
a lot of data from Facebook and you can ask people from, uh, and I think uh, the team that worked for this project has access to CrowdTangle. And second, uh, something that most people don't know, there is a, a Chrome extension of CrowdTangle, which is free for everybody. Uh, you can uh, search for this CrowdTangle Chrome extension. Uh, this uh, extension should be uh, uploaded to Chrome. And then uh, you can use any type of link. Uh, and uh, using that uh, Chrome extension, just click on it when you have the link open. Uh, that extension will get you data about where that link is shared on uh, social on Facebook, on, on the pages and the groups that are, uh, is uh, shared, uh, when was shared, how many interactions uh, generated, and so on. There are a lot of data that uh, this uh, instrument uh, provides you. Uh, other type of instruments are free for trial. And I also recommend people using that because uh, you can have a lot of uh, creativity in creating uh, uh, email accounts in order to use uh, tools free for one week or two and collect the data that you need. And um, other type of instruments are uh, depending on the uh, availability of risk money. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can, if there are no more questions, I think we can uh, continue our workshop to, and I will introduce our team members that will present the study and its results. So to begin, Flavia Dura will be speaking to us about the context of the research, the Literature Foundation. Flavia Dura is an associate professor at the College of Communication and Public Relations, NSPA. She's also a project expert in this study. Also, her uh, research interests include the study of media effects, online disinformation, strategic communication, the role of digital platforms. So, Flavia Durak will present us the context of the research and the literature. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Katarina, for the introduction. Um, so, um, uh, today I'm going to uh, present uh, the project very briefly and the literature review again very briefly in order to uh, make room for the most consistent presentations, namely our uh, results. Uh, about the project, uh, the project was funded through the second uh, round of the Civica call for research proposals. Um, it, and it falls under the priority area, data-driven technologies for social sciences. Um, the aim of the project is to uh, pilot the use of digital technologies, and we explored a number of, of options in this regard, to map and study how the issue of COVID-19 vaccination was debated and also uh, framed in online Facebook communities. And for this uh, aim, um, we um, expected our final outcome to be a scalable, interdisciplinary and mixed method, uh, methodological framework for this purpose. Um, and in the following uh, slides, I will justify why we opted for a mixed method approach and uh, why we um, found it uh, useful. And the two countries of, of focus are Romania and Hungary, reflecting our partnership in, in this project, obviously. Um, our project, is uh, drawn uh, from an um, interdisciplinary approach uh, at the intersection between communication sciences, because for instance, we were pre preoccupied with the study of misinformation narratives that circulated online during this period, sociology uh, in terms of attitudes towards vaccines and vaccinations, uh, vaccination, sorry, a big data analysis uh, in terms of uh, interactions and reactions uh, in online communities on Facebook, more, more specifically. And um, we also um, uh, wanted to do a sentiment analysis in order to measure attitudes towards vaccines and vaccination as they are expressed uh, in the, these online communities. And uh, lastly, um, we are preoccupied with the study of EU-wide narratives uh, because uh, one of the points in the literature was that uh, disinformation narratives that circulated during the COVID-19 pandemic were transnational in nature 
in the sense that they were projected, constructed, and disseminated in similar ways um, across the globe, basically. It was one of the first uh, global epidemics of fake news on a particular subject. This is why um, the whole flow of this information uh, was uh, aptly named uh, infodemic, because it was a global epidemic, pandemic of this information. Um, so, we were interested in this information about uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccination because uh, the literature links belief in conspiracy theories and misinformation with um, vaccine hesitancy. And also uh, there are research insights that show that social media consumption for information purposes can be uh, damaging on vaccination intent as well. Uh, what we knew from the start about vaccine content on social media is that uh, it is dominated by anti-vaccination sentiment. This does not necessarily mean that anti-vaccination sentiment is prevalent in the population, but that means that we have at least a vocal group of people who dominate the online public discourse. Um, there is a very limited uh, proportion of official information, unreliable sources being uh, more capable to uh, become vi viral in the online environment. And lastly, that engagement with anti-vaccine content is higher than uh, with pro-vaccine content. Uh, from the methodological standpoint, uh, past studies on health-related misinformation were mostly quantitative in nature. For instance, social media trend analysis, social network analysis, sentiment analysis, uh, machine learning classification, um, and in the occasions uh, in which vaccine-related conversations were analyzed in uh, social media, sorry, that was uh, being done with uh, computational, uh, computational means. Okay, uh, in terms of um, being able to map a wider picture of the public conversation on social media, we uh, identified uh, two types of studies. Um, that were not necessarily, um, I don't know, overlapping. So on one hand, we had cross-country studies. Uh, we, you have some examples here in, in the slides. For instance, the use of uh, mixed methods analysis that underline the cultural context of online conversations with a focus on um, narratives, recurrent themes. Um, other times, uh, semantic network analysis to measure cross-country perceptions of the COVID-19 vaccine. And on the other hand, we have a small sample, uh, or what we identified at, at the moment of writing, uh, a small sample of mixed method studies uh, that rely, for instance, on the quantitative uh, ranking of algorithms um, combined with uh, qualitative content analysis on tweets in uh, one case. Uh, and other mixed method studies focused on measuring vaccine opposition and identify themes, relevant themes within this type of uh, conversations. So from our study, we identified uh, the gap in the literature in the sense that we couldn't find studies that were cross country and um, use combined qualitative and quantitative methods uh, to um, assess vaccine-related conversations on Facebook. And also, we found no uh, types of studies with these characteristics that focus especially on misinformation narratives that are constructed in these uh, spaces and that focus on this type of uh, comparison. So th this was the raison d'etre for our project. Um, and here I would like to conclude with an, an acknowledgement of the team composition. And um, I would like to um, thank all the team members for their contributions, Bianca Florentina Keregi, uh, Loredana Vladu, Roxana Varvara Boboc, Catalina Anastasiu, Eva Bognar, and uh, Judith Sakas. Uh, hope I'm pronouncing correctly. I apologize if not. Um, uh, and of course, uh, the speaker. <laughs> Um, thank you uh, again for uh, your attention, and um, I'm open to questions uh, in the Q&A session if you have them. 
Thank you. Thank you. We will have a short Q&A after um, all team members will present the results and the methodology. Uh, thank you, Flavia, for your remarks and uh, the con presenting the context and the literature uh, of this study. I will uh, say that we can continue and uh, for the following part, Bianca Kerigi will be speaking to us about the methodology. Bianca Kerigi is a PhD lecturer at the College of Communication, CNSPA, and project expert. Her research interests include nation branding, marketing in the digital context, and aspect of social media and consumer behavior. She's also a member of the Communication Discourse Public Issue Lab, affiliated to the Center of Research in Communication. So Bianca Kerigi will be speaking to us about the methodology of this study. Yes. So thank you very much, uh, Catalina, for the introduction. I am very glad uh, to be discussing about the methodology. Now I'm trying to search for my presentation because I have so many tabs open. So just a second to identify the PowerPoint and start with uh, the methodology. I think we encountered uh, some challenges in performing this methodology. Uh, and after the presentations that you gave until uh, now, uh, I managed to realize that uh, we were quite enthusiastic at the beginning, uh, but um, in the meantime, I think we managed uh, to create a very strong methodology. Uh, well, um, I will um, try to, to open uh, the, the document just a second. Yes, it's here. So now I think you can uh, see my uh, my screen. Yes. I will try to make it just a second. Yes. So now we reached the, to uh, the challenging part of our project in a way. And uh, we had a lot of discussion with our partners from Central European University, trying to, uh, to establish the most important research questions uh, that uh, we should start with. Uh, of course, uh, we are looking um, in three directions, first and foremost, in order to create, because these were the main objective, uh, to create, uh, test and validate a scalable and uh, mixed method framework in order to map the conversation about vaccination in both, in two countries, in fact, in Romania and Hungary. So first of all, the, the, the research question that you can see on this slide, we looked into the main topics of debate within the most prominent public Facebook um, uh, groups and pages related to COVID-19 vaccination in Romania and Hungary comparatively. Uh, here, uh, we used uh, the Facebook metrics platform CrowdTangle in order to gather our data for research. Uh, and uh, our focus was, uh, as you can see, on Facebook pages and uh, groups. Uh, well, we used CrowdTangle, our, our institutional access to CrowdTangle uh, in order to, to gather our data. And also we established a keyword list that we will discuss immediately. For the second research question, well, here we looked at the dominant attitudes towards the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, vaccine ex that were expressed uh, through the most prominent Facebook communities. And here we used, um, we used um, sentiment analysis software in order to determine the polarity of the text about uh, the vaccination. So uh, we assessed if it was positive, neutral, or negative. And uh, as for the third research questions, well, here we changed a little bit the focus and looked into the main misinformation narratives that were disseminated uh, within uh, the most prominent Facebook public pages and groups in Romania and Hungary. Uh, here we also looked into the linguistic markers, if we found pro or anti-vaccination linguistic markers, also forms of positive self-presentation and negative other presentation. We will see that these were also present and also the use of uncertainty words, hashtags, and metaphors that were related to this topic. Also, we identified the most frequent social and political actors that appeared in the subset of our data. And uh, moving forward, further, well, uh, we employed the mixed method framework. 
which combines qualitative and quantitative methodology to social media scrapping tools uh, to assess this methodology on a set of Facebook data that was collected from Romania and Hungary. As you can see on this slide, we use the three methods. First of all, uh, sentiment analysis. Uh, here, this was a challenge because uh, we also used a software uh, that uh, helped us uh, to assess the polarity. Uh, then for the qualitative uh, part, uh, we use ethnography and uh, critical discourse analysis. First of all, we use ethnography in order to assess some types of communities, vaxxers, anti-vaxxers, uh, and so on and so forth. As for the critical discourse analysis, we uh, try to establish some uh, discursive strategies that they were used in order to discuss on this uh, very, very hot topic. Um, as uh, I mentioned earlier, the data was collected with the help of our institutional crowd angle. Uh, and here you can see the keywords list that we used. Uh, of course, uh, this list uh, was um, discussed uh, by all the researchers uh, in order to um, contain uh, the, um, the elements that were most prominent in the periods that we selected. So that is why you can see uh, elements such as Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, because the discussion was pretty powerful on this subject per se. Also the booster dose, the green certificate, the Omicron wave, which was uh, uh, very powerful uh, in that, uh, that period. Uh, the secondary effects uh, of vaccination and also um, the, the concept of inject. So this uh, was the keyword list, which was translated uh, of course, uh, in Romanian and Hungarian, in order to identify the most important uh, social media posts. And moving uh, further, well, here, uh, due to the data driven network and the nature of our project, uh, the data was, collecting, was uh, collected uh, considering uh, two important uh, periods. Uh, this, those periods were also uh, relevant for Romania and uh, Hungary as well. And uh, as um, Dan Sultanescu showed us earlier in, in his presentation, we can see that these periods were also considered in the Google Trends um, uh, graphic about vaccination because we can see some peaks right there. So um, uh, the first period was, uh, as you can see, 1, 30 November, 2021. Uh, which was chosen because November was um, the, um, the month when the EU's digital COVID certificate discussions were in bloom. So we considered it very, very relevant. While the second period, 15 January, 15 February 2022, was selected because uh, uh, it marked the outbreak of the Omicron wave uh, in the European Union. So uh, these were the, um, uh, the period that we selected. You can see also the number of posts that we considered uh, to analyze in this particular period. Uh, this, um, this slide shows you the data collection for Romania. And now we, move, we will move further to the data collection from Hungary, uh, because uh, here uh, we can also see these uh, two important periods, uh, but there are some differences regarding uh, the number of the posts, of the social media posts uh, analyzed. So now um, I think uh, we can uh, uh, move uh, further to the methodology per se. Uh, so uh, I will try to point out very briefly some elements uh, so we can go uh, to the results section, which I think uh, uh, it will be uh, very, very interesting uh, to look at. Uh, so um, as for the quantitative analysis, uh, we looked at the most active pages and groups. Uh, we looked uh, at uh, the most interacted with in terms of comments and shared uh, pages and groups, the most used uh, type of content. Uh, we saw that um, if they used video or uh, photographs or text. Also, we looked at the top overperforming pages and groups uh, because uh, we find them very relevant in the discussion around the COVID-19 vaccination and also uh, at the interaction uh, breakdown for most active pages and groups in the two countries. Um, at the qu quantitative analysis, um, the sentiment analysis part, I think it was uh, um, one of the most challenging uh, because uh, we had to um, uh, understand also how uh, the software IntelliDocker functions. We use this software in order to, uh, to assign a polarity 
uh, at um, considering the social media posts uh, that we selected in that period. So uh, this sentiment analysis software uh, is in fact uh, a deep learning model which assesses the polarity of any given text content starting from three elements. If it is negative, it is neutral or positive. Uh, here you can see the accuracy and the precision that is associated uh, to our uh, data set. For, for instance, uh, for the Romanian language data set, the accuracy was pretty high. We had an accuracy of uh, 0 0.95 approximately, uh, and the precision was also high, 0 0.95. Uh, but we have some limits for the Hungarian language data set where the accuracy was not so high, uh, 0 0.65 and the precision um, around 0 0.65. So, I think uh, these are also limits because uh, the, um, the software uh, IntelliDocker was trained uh, for data that usually came from news, articles, reviews, and so on and so forth, but not specifically for social media data. So even though we have this accuracy uh, from uh, the software, well, uh, in our results, uh, we will see some, uh, some other elements uh, coming into our attention. As for the qualitative analysis, well, here we have a coding scheme because uh, we coded top 100 posts per period for each country. So here we looked into some, uh, some elements, uh, such as the type of matter of concern, if the posts, the social media posts were related to the health element, to the political element, to demonstration, to conspiracy element, uh, to the news or also information from local health authorities. And here I want to point out the fact that as Professor Arina Burgoanu uh, said at the beginning of our workshop, uh, this is also a geopolitical and political topic. And this will also result from our, um, from our um, results uh, section. Uh, the tone evoked, we also looked uh, at the main feeling of the post, if uh, they um, tend to critique the political system, or, or, or if uh, they were only informational or they used some, uh, some appeal to emotion. We also looked at the action suggested, and here I can, um, uh, I can discuss about political support, about uh, the distrust, and also the political change, which uh, was intensely discussed uh, in the Romanian data set, for instance. Also, we looked into to the vector stance, uh, if we saw pro-certificate versus anti-certificate stances, pro-restriction versus anti-restriction, and pro-vaccination versus anti-vaccination, but also neutral elements. And also we looked at key elements to summarize each post um, relevant for the narrative used. As for the critical discourse analysis that I mentioned um, earlier, because uh, the um, the framework was based on a mix, on a quantitative qualitative mix. Uh, here uh, we try to, to look uh, into the argumentation strategies, the claims of truth that the actors made in the social media posts. So the constructive strategies, the way they presented by using positive self-presentation and um, using negative other presentation, for instance, the anti-vaxxers uh, used negative other presentation when relating to the vectors. Uh, the evaluation strategies, and here the focus were, were on the consequences of COVID-19 vaccination and uh, also the medical um, uh, effects that were related to it. Uh, the enunci enunciation strategies, how they interpolate a specific actor, a social or political. The nomination strategy, and here we looked at membership categorization. There are a lot of, um, um, a lot of concepts that they were used in order to categorize the uh, vec vectors in a way and the anti-vectors. On the other hand, uh, the responsibility attributions here, we looked at the actors and accountability in specific context and also at um, the use of uh, semiotic resource, uh, how they used the specific metaphors. And we will see that um, the uh, vaccination was compared with uh, the Berlin Wall in a specific uh, social media post, but I will uh, leave here uh, my colleague Roxana to tell you more about uh, the results. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca, for presenting the methodology of this study. So finally, the 
the results will be presented by two of our team members from Romania and Hungary. So first from Romania, Roxana Varvara Bobok is a PhD uh, candidate at CNSPA, an expert in this project, and uh, she will be presenting the um, preliminary results. She's um, her main research topic in the PhD thesis is the European Union regulatory framework on emerging technologies, and she's also interested in developing various digital methodologies to map out discourse in several media contexts. So, Roxana Varvara Bobok to present us the results from Romania. Thank you very much, Catalina, for the introduction. Uh, can you see the right screen? Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you to my colleagues for uh, explaining to you all the project thus far. So I will start with um, some of the key findings that you're going to um, discover with uh, the results from Romania. So I just want to basically clarify some of the main insights that we came across. The first of one, uh, the first of which would be that politicians and political commentators attracted the most engagement. Now that would seem obvious, but we will see from um, the uh, number of actors who produced the most content, how much this insight is actually valuable for later on in the qualitative part. We also uh, concluded that the main COVID framing was less about a health public issue that it was, and similarly to what the Dean was telling at the beginning of the presentation, it was rather politically orientated, aiming at critiquing the political system. So this was kind of the main way in which COVID was being discussed. Uh, some of the main narratives were less about the vaccine, even though we tried to find a lot about the vaccine opposition, the vaxxers, the anti-vaxxers, so on and so forth, but in fact, the core of the discussion was more switched towards the opposition towards the EU digital certificate or green certificate, we're just going to call it certificate throughout the presentation. That gave the right wing um, representatives some um, national political discourse domination. So there was a lot of political actors demanding the citizens for political support by positioning themselves as uh, marching against this um, making the digital COVID certificate mandatory. And lastly, and one of the most worrying aspects that we found that is different from the results of our counterpart in Hungary was that uh, there was a lot of conspiracy going around, but conspiracy rooted in actually real resentment and discontent from the Romanian citizens. So let's just jump into it. And I'm going to give you kind of the general approach of our uh, all of our posts. So we try to make it as uh, clear as possible. So this is the first chunk, the first period of time. And as you can see, uh, the people who or the actors who produced the most content were news associations, news companies. Uh, it's uh, It might become obvious because of course, uh, COVID was the um, hottest thing to be discussed about. But if you see here, there are there is just a small percentage of politicians who actually produced content about that. So that is why the fact that these a small percentage attracted so much engagement makes this discussion more in, uh, important. Now, when we switch to the most used post types, that was the link. And that is a kind of double-edged sword. So there is the first kind of claim that, of course, it will be the link. The news companies are going to link their news uh, on their Facebook posts, and that is valid for some of the posts. But what we also found is a sort of platform migration where a lot of uh, the people who posted introduced some alternative, unreliable sources uh, that sent the users outside the social media platforms and into a whole, let's say, spiral of misinformation um, sources. Now, uh, when we look at the top interacted with pages and uh, just um, kind of arbitrarily, we looked at the ones with over 30,000 reacts of any kind, uh, just to try to make it into like a smaller, more visually um, clear sample. We're going to see that in the first period of time, the, the person who attracted the most attention was the leader of the Alliance for the Union of Romanians, George Simeon, who, as you can see, uh, garnered the most uh, interactions of any kind. Now, if you see the second person here is um, a member of the European Parliament who was very vehement about discussing uh, the fact that the European Parliament has too strict rules regarding the wear uh, of masks. 
And so he made it into an entire series critiquing the EU, critiquing democracy, critiquing so on and so forth. And that is why he got a lot of attention as well. Now, when we look two places further at the national platform of vaccination, we see that it hardly ever reached the half the number of interactions as as these two previous actors, which speaks a lot about what sort of content people consumed online about the vaccination. If we look at the groups, the situation is even more bleak. So you can see that the first group that attracted the most, attract the most attention was a group of supporters of this right wing leader um, who uh, was very closely followed by a group that was very vehemently opposing the uh, mandatory part of uh, the COVID certificate. So this too shows exactly the sort of sentiment and narrative that we have in the first period of time, people being very aggressively against the COVID certificate. If we look at the second chunk of time, so a lot of time has passed, COVID is still the hottest topic, but people got a bit tired of the restrictions, they got tired of the lockdown. So there is a lot of, again, news channel activity, but we also have a lot of activity um, in terms of speaking about not necessarily vaccines, but protests. And we're going to see that in a bit, uh, how that affected the results. Again, the same argument for the link. It is a double-edged sword again. It is still regarding to the presence of the news companies, but it's also a source for misinformation and platform migration. When we look at the most interacted with pages, now here we see news sources as ranking the first. And that is because a lot of the news sources uh, spread the word about protests around the world. And those protests were weaponized by a lot of especially right-wing parties and being discussed as, hey, this is happening, we should be doing that too. So it was a clear encouragement of protest from the part of the instigators. Now, the other people that you can see or the other actors that you see here are kind of twofold. You have the right-wing representatives, you have a lot of agitators, and you also have a lot of alternative information sources. So these are channels that claim to be news sources, but in fact, just voice different right wing extreme discourse. When we look at the groups, uh, we see here another huge change. So there is still uh, the support for the right wing party, but we also see a lot of alternative information about how to deal with COVID, both from the perspective of how to treat it medically with a lot of alternative anything but medicine sort of narrative and how to treat it ideologically. Is it a real thing? Was it created in a lab? It's uh, the result of a newer order. So that a lot of alternative disinformation and misinformation goes around, especially in groups. Now let's switch our attention to our qualitative analysis for the first period of time. Now, I think this clarifies a lot about what we discussed in the beginning with our source, uh, with our main insights. So even though the news companies uh, are the biggest creators of content, the people who attracted the most, attentions, the most attention were definitely the, the politicians. And that is why COVID is mostly framed as a political issue. Now, this political issue is mostly targeting uh, at two things. First of all, critiquing the political system for the means of sparking outrage, so creating fragmentation, and also for the end of political support. Now, political support is basically what right-wing uh, actors demanded. So they were like, we're going to help you achieve this if you support us in, um, in our quest. Uh, instigating distrust was another action that was being followed by uh, political and conspiracy portray of, uh, of COVID uh, situations. And that led to uh, a very heavy um, spread of disinformation uh, on this top, uh, top 100 posts. Another category that, that we see here is demonstration, and we're going to see how much it uh, gains traction a bit later on, but basically this is about uh, the way in which a lot of right-wing actors encourage people to protest against uh, vaccinations, against restrictions, against, against COVID restrictions in general. And as you can see here, the most or the main COVID stance that we have is the anti-certificate one. Now, in order to see who exactly produced this content, I just wanted to clarify that with, first of all, the leader of um, 
uh, the our party, uh, the right wing party, and also the member of European Parliament who complained about the European Union, so produced a lot of anti EU uh, narratives. But also we have a lot of agitators and still a lot of alternative source information you can see that the Romanian vaccination platform from the first 100 posts has probably one or two posts in total. So that is kind of alarming. Uh, zooming in on some problematic instances, we see a very combative, a very aggressive discourse going around where the COVID certificate is seen as a threat to fundamental rights and to democracy. There is a very clear nationalist tone and there are plenty of nativism references. These are the most references used when discussing the COVID certificate. Uh, and that's why the COVID was framed as a political issue on two different planes. The first of them, is, the first of which is, is that uh, this mandatory certificate is a threat to freedom that gave the right wing representatives a topic to demand political support in extreme nationalist discourse, encouraging protests against restrictions and vaccination. On the other hand, it was also uh, used and weaponized as an anti-EU discourse where uh, the regulation was being uh, attacked as well as the contracting of different vaccine companies. So EU was often portrayed as a switch from democracy to tyranny because there is no way it can allow its governments to impose these rules that infringe uh, basic human rights. So this is the way in which it was framed. In terms of uh, the way in which the proof of the vaccine was being portrayed, it was seen as unconstitutional. It was, being, it was considered a means for dictatorship and population control, a means to segregate and discriminate that infringe fundamental constitutional uh, rights. It was oftentimes called a Nazi pass, a work passport, and a sign of government obedience. So people who would get the vaccine would be slaves. By contrast, the people who would be opposed to vaccination would be seen as quote unquote pro-choice, woke, and discriminated against by this large mass of people who want to, to be controlled by governments. Uh, and that leads us to our main conspiracies that were being vehiculated in our first chunk of time. First of all, and the most popular by far, is the one of the New World Order or any sort of secret interest conspiracy. Uh, COVID uh, was being seen as a pandemic or as a plan where the mandatory certificate is a means to population control by this uh, group of elites. Uh, there are plenty of references to the Kellergy plan, plan, to the Pitesh experiment. Uh, there was a lot of call to pseudo experts who would debunk several parts of the COVID uh, in a lot of uh, chunk, big chunks of content, like videos of one hour long, where guests would, ex would describe that COVID was created in a lab or the side effects of uh, the vaccine produce autism or produce sudden death in adults, that the regulation is means to dictatorship. So all of this were given a lot of time and a lot of interest in the first part of our uh, time period. Moving on to the second, we see quite um, a bit of a difference here, mostly in the fact that we see more news companies producing the content. But again, that content was mostly regarding protests so it was still used as a political subject. Uh, now here you see that demonstration became more popular than conspiracy. And that is because, again, the demonstration was being seen as, um, let's say, a mantra to act, a model. Let's take the model of our, all of these people who uh, fight for their rights and instigate our own kind of political change. So this was the main action suggested. And this political change was achieved either by sparking enough outrage, so creating enough polarization and enough aggression for people to act, and also instigated enough distrust so that people would not follow the Romanian vaccination campaign, um, that they would not get the vaccine. So um, here, that's why you see that the certificate is still the main COVID stance, the anti-certificate, but is very closely followed by the anti-restrictions uh, part, because here restrictions cover everything that was being protested about. Uh, now, again, if we look a bit closely here, we can still find similar actors. So we still have the right wing leader. We still have the EU, um, the EP representative member. But we mostly have, again, obscure or unreliable uh, information sources, which basically produce most of the problematic uh, 
um, content. And here we see two of the most problematic or the, the main agitators in this sense, mostly because they're very vehement about why the vaccine or COVID in general is a hoax. And they provide their own version of arguments and their version of truth of why that is. If we look a bit closer on the second time period, again, we're going to see that the Alliance for the Union of the Romanians still dominates the white ring discourse and still preaches nationalist and populist views, framing themselves as the representative of the common man uh, that fight against the certificate and against the allegedly incompetent or corrupt politicians. So you clearly see the populist view. Uh, there is also a lot of emphasis on the global protests that are further encouraged by uh, the, wrong, the right wing representatives. And there is a different sort of critique this time on the COVID uh, situation, first of all, by the means of the vaccine companies. Um, so these are being criticized in terms of why did EU partner with these particular companies? These partnerships came up and came up too fast. The prices are too high. So it's definitely something going on in sort of the new world order and um, secret partnerships going in the in the background. Uh, the, the COVID certificate was again seen a bit differently in this time period. So it was first of all deemed inefficient health wise. Uh, it was also the first time that it was uh, framed as a threat to the economy, and it was considered that the natural immunization is better than any sort of vaccine or, or certificate, that making the vaccine or the certificate a, a means of apartheid, um, that portrayed the dictatorship, threats to democratic rights, and still we have Nazi references sprinkled all over the, the discussion on, on the topic. Now, this is where it gets a bit more problematic because there is a rise in the conspiracy threat, not so much in the number of appearances. They're kind of the same percentage here, but it is in the, the time dedicated to debunk several issues. So the content being put out there to debunk conspiracies goes from one long post or a one hour long video to longer posts, two longer, uh, two hours long videos a lot of guests, a lot of um, actors who are uh, informed on the, on the topic. And these are some of the most uh, spread conspiracy theories. Again, we have the New World Order. We have references, a lot of references to the Great Reset, references to the globalist plan, uh, references to the world occult, to uh, a new religion where people who get a vaccine become part of a new religion. Uh, we see COVID as a plan of the financial elites to make more money. Uh, there is a lot of discussion this time on the side effects because some time has passed and some people got the vaccine and there were a lot of testimonials about people who die suddenly or people who did not have the COVID before the vaccine got the, uh, uh, the disease after getting the vaccine. There are claims that the most of the vaccines are experimental serums and anyone who supports the vaccination um, process is uh, basically propagating propaganda. And there is also this uh, thing that anyone who supports vaccination is a member of this new progressive globalist totalitarian ideology. So this seem a bit maybe far-fetched for some of you, but in reality, some of the posts kind of proved the opposite. So among our top 100 posts, we came across two surveys from um, actually big news companies that showed two things. First of all, almost 30% of Romanians believe the conspiracy that there is a global plan for implanting chips through vaccination, which weirdly enough did not come up in our, um, in our post. So this one with the chips is maybe if you want more mainstream than that. Uh, but even more so, uh, a whopping 65% of Romanians believe that the pandemic was caused by the global elites to control the world. So as much as uh, the conspiracies may be uh, founded on complete lack of truth, this is the truth for a lot of Romanian people. And this is why they're so susceptible to receiving this information and to engaging with this information online. Now, because of that, we also wanted to see the sentiment analysis. And it was not necessarily uh, a 
win for us because most of the posts were seen were deemed neutral by the tool and uh, we of course manually checked it did not add up and so we considered the sentiment analysis invalid for some reasons so first of all it's because as Bianca said the algorithm was mostly trained on news articles and that made it unfit for the sort of communication happening online. A lot of the specificities got lost in translation. And so the algorithm didn't really know what to do with uh, poor grammar, with a lot of emojis, with unfinished sentences. Um, so it was not something that it could deal with. And also there is uh, the undeniable difference between anything that is trained for the English language and anything that is trained for everything other than that so in our case Hungarian and Romanian uh, and overall I would say that this is a limitation in general when working with AI NLP big data technologies in general in studying communication on social media and that is why as Dan Sultan has also mentioned we need to um, be able to adapt and to make the quick changes that we need to in order to uh, to have the data set that we need but also why we necessarily need the qualitative analysis uh, and which also implies a lot of, indeed, yes, uh, filtering of information, filtering of data. But we found an alternative. Uh, we thought that for, uh, in order to get the overall sentiment of what was going on, we looked at the reactions breakdown from the top 20 most reacted pages. So what we did is that we excluded the likes, which were, of course, the most popular means of engagement. And we looked at the breakdown of reactions of the most popular pages. This is from the first chunk of time. And if you would not see uh, sort of this uh, legend here, you would say that uh, the news organization is great, that has a lot of reactions. But when you look closely, you see that it mostly has um, the haha reaction or said reaction, which means that the information uh, shared there is not taken seriously. Whereas if you switch to uh, the uh, right wing leader and the member of the European Parliament, the main reaction being used is actually a love react. So it is a very high intensity emotion that is rather associated with these actors. Uh, when we look at the groups, we see a similar thing. So when you look at the group of supporters of the right-wing leader, you see a mix of the two main emotions that are usually being uh, weaponized by the right-wing parties, which is love and hate, right? So you have a lot of love and a lot of angry acts that make for the perfect mix of having this fragmented, this polarized audience that they actually need for the political support. When we switch to the other time frame in the pages, we see the same thing, a lot of news sources uh, whose information is not taken seriously, and a lot of instigators who have a lot of strong reactions. Uh, the same can be said about the groups. Uh, again, you have a lot of people who, uh, as you can see, became a bit tired of the subject and they're not taking it that seriously. But here you see more angry and um, happy reactions rather than love and hate. So to conclude, uh, we saw a lot of polar polarization, fragmentation, agitation, hate, right-wing nationalist and populist discourse. Uh, we saw the, that COVID was an opportunity for right-wing to achieve political support in a rather aggressive manner. And uh, we saw that social media was a fertile environment for filter bubbles, for mis- and disinformation spread, as well as very heavy conspiracy spread, which begs us to ask a few overarching questions when doing social media research in general. So who uses what social media platforms? Because it's clear from our analysis that we're definitely dealing with a very particular group of people here. Uh, how do they use the social media? So do they use it to connect with people? Do they use it to, um, to gain information? Do they use it to uh, express their opinion? To what end and what are their communication behaviors and specificities? And this is going to vary greatly from mainstream platform to fringe uh, platforms. So everything has to be taken kind of from, uh, from scratch. So uh, this is maybe um, a call for the need for critical usage of mixed methods in order to tackle all sorts of technical and scientific obstacles. So thank you for your attention. And I will now give the floor to our um, Hungarian counterpart who had very different results from us, actually. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Roxana Bobok, for presenting the results from Romania. And yes, uh, finally, our uh, 
uh, last speaker, our team member, Judith Takac, will present us the results from Hungary. And uh, Judith Takac is an outreach coordinator at the Center for Media, Data, and Society at the Central European University. She, her main research interests include minorities in the media, as well as disinformation. And she has co-authored three papers for the European Parliament on disinformation and propaganda. So Judith will present us the results from Hungary. Yes, thank you. I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, just a second. Okay, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Hungarian results, which, as uh, we heard, are uh, rather different from the Romanian ones. And I think these differences are really fascinating and uh, would be interesting to address um, uh, the reasons, the possible reasons. Um, first, I created a little timeline, which I'm not going to talk about in detail, but uh, it need, I needed a reminder because it seems like ages ago that we were all talking about masks and booster shots and you know like the fourth wave so i did this just as a sort of a, to give the context to the research but i do want to point out one major difference from romania is that in hungary we did have mandatory uh, covid vaccines and as you can see it started for certain occupational groups so it started in the summer of 2021 where healthcare when healthcare workers were required to get vaccinated and then at the end of october so right before our first time period for the research uh, the government issued a decree um, which mandated um, the COVID vaccine for certain state and local government employees, uh, such as teachers or um, social workers, the police, and some other groups. And also um, um, private companies were given the right to um, um, require their employees to get vaccinated. And this is very heavily um, visible in our data. And this is also a very different context from Romania. And um, also in January, so right before we looked at the second period, um, the consequences started to appear, namely that on 3rd January, those uh, state employees who did not get vaccinated were uh, forced to take unpaid leaves, which basically means that teachers uh, were not allowed to go to school or to, to work or um, police officers or like I said, tax inspectors, if they didn't get vaccinated. And this is again, very heavily uh, features in our data. So that's why I thought that it was important. And uh, I would like to add one more um, date here, which is April 3rd, when Hungary had the general elections. And uh, um, particularly in the second time period that we are looking at, so in January and February, um, it was very obvious that parties were uh, preparing to campaign and uh, um, uh, they used COVID for that purpose. Okay, so let's look at the, the data. Um, it's very similar uh, to Romania in the sense that um, in both time periods, we had uh, uh, news media and news sites uh, to generate the most content. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the second uh, largest group was this Activity General, which uh, is now actually Facebook now calls it interest groups or interest pages. And uh, this is a very general page. And um, so it doesn't give us much uh, information about uh, who these people are. It includes anything from influencers to activists to like even a local government set its pages Activity General. So. Um, I don't know, it, I don't think that's very, very useful in terms of analysis and community. The third category can also mean anything um, that we, um, that, that people were just thinking. So it's it's very general too. Uh, what I'd like to point out is that um, um, in the second time period, as you can see, the political parties, political organizations and politicians started posting more. And obviously this is connected to the upcoming general elections, as I as I mentioned before, um, and if we uh, look at um, the data, the top 
posters. Uh, this is even more evident. What I did here was uh, the, the dominance of the news media is even more evident. What I did here is I took the top uh, 100 uh, uh, um, active, most active posters, at most active posters, and then uh, I categorized them. Uh, and as you can see, in both time periods, it's, it was news uh, websites and news pages that that posted the most uh, content in Hungary. Uh, but this, uh, as we see, so in Romania, does not mean that they had the highest engagement. Does not necessarily mean that uh, they had the highest engagement. Ex except in Hungary, it kind of does. Uh, most uh, again, this is a very interesting difference that uh, most of the um, top uh, mostly interactive pages were uh, news media pages in Hungary in both time periods. But in the November period, the Hungarian government's official page generated the most interactions, followed by uh, two media outlets. And in um, the January and February time period, it was a right-wing radical politician, Do Dora Duro. So again, this uh, signals the um, upcoming election and also uh, in that time period, we see more uh, opposition leaders posting more and generating more engagement as well. But as I said, in general, unlike in Romania, I think um, in Hungary, uh, you can't really say that uh, uh, politicians uh, uh, generated the most engagement. Um, and the, yeah, I just wanted to add this uh, um, Dora Duro, this radical politician in one a month uh, in January and February, she posted 144 posts on COVID alone. I think that's uh, pretty pretty impressive uh, for uh, for her page. So uh, she definitely tried to use uh, um, the COVID uh, as um, uh, as um, an F, as, as to to gain political uh, uh, um, success and. Um, uh, we also looked at the reactions breakdown, as you saw in the Romanian data, and um, 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 it is, uh, if I uh, go back to the, if, if you see the, the um, likes are always more, always higher for uh, politicians, uh, which I think it kind of means, as you can see, for example, here, like, I don't know whether you see my mouse or here, he's a politician uh, or here. Um, I think that um, suggests kind of that uh, politicians are already, at least in this context, um, like preaching to the choir uh, in that, that they are attracting their own um, um, followers and then talking to them. So they, they get the, the like reactions. Um, and, uh, but, um, um, as, you, as uh, we saw in Romania, here too, the haha and the angry reactions dominate in general. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether, uh, like, how much we can see, like, look into it. I, I, we didn't discuss this part, so obviously it's just my opinion that uh, we don't know the algorithm. Like, how uh, there were there there were reports that f at least for a time Facebook was pushing uh, posts uh, that had more angry reactions for example. So that might impact what we saw and what we could capture here. And also, I think um, it's just an emoji. So uh, I think if the government announcement uh, gets an angry reaction, for example, here, as you can see, a large proportion of angry reactions, that might mean that people are unhappy about what was announced. But if an opposition politician gets a lot of angry reactions, it might mean that she was successful in like um generating outrage so i um i'm not sure um that uh, we can really uh, how how far we can go in uh and in interpreting this uh, sort of uh emoji so this sort of data but anyway i think it's it's interesting and um the sad like as you can see there's like a large um, uh, part of proportion of sad um, sadness the green here uh for uh Media outlets, Blick, is, which is a tabloid, and Havige, which is a, a news media or magazine, uh, those were mostly generated by these human interest stories where, like, they had all these, um, like, someone lost their parents or wife due to COVID, and um, that generated a lot of sad reactions. Um, okay, let's now talk to the, talk about the groups. Um, what we saw was that uh, 
this information group groups were really highly active in generating content. Um, in uh, the top 10 uh, groups, um, the most active groups, six in both time periods were conspiracy, conspiracy theorists or disinformation groups. And uh, in November, they, they were posting a lot. In November, the group with the highest number of posts had 299 posts, and in the second time period, 252. And um, engagement was pretty high among these groups, but it was low compared to main, mainstream pages. So um, when, when we looked at the um, quantitative data or, or the qualitative data, only one uh, post generated by a page made it to the top 100 in both, like, uh, in both time periods. So uh, that shows that in Hungary, it's more, more mainstream pages that dominated the discourse. And um, um, also it was very interesting that uh, the most engagement uh, was uh, generated, as you can see, or most uh, interactions were generated by this uh, group called Coronavirus Vaccinatio, which is actually, um, pretty uh, neutral uh, group. Uh, it was uh, collecting, or it is still collecting uh, peer reviewed uh, research on, on uh, COVID vaccines. So it's very interesting that although there is a lot of disinformation going on here, the most highly engaged uh, uh, groups uh, group is in both time periods, this page or this group that posts um, um, scientific and fact-checked and reliable information. And I, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about this later, right? what might be the cause of it, but I think this is a very interesting finding. Um, and then, okay, let's now talk about the uh, qu uh, qualitative analysis. Um, and as you've heard, we selected the top 100 most engaged posts in both time periods and looked at the, the narratives. And uh, we have tried using, I've tried using similar uh, categories as in Romania, but um, we had to sort of adjust it to the context, obviously. Um, and what was really striking at first, when I looked at it, the data first, was that there were like minor politicians and small media outlets and people that I've never heard about who made it in the top 100. So um, Facebook in sometimes does give uh, uh, these, um, uh, relatively unknown uh, people uh, platform that they could use for. And this is an example that you can see here. Um, this uh, post is from uh, a small group that only has uh, 5,500 followers. And uh, normally the posts posted by the admin who posted this get like 150 interactions. And this time, uh, uh, who knows why, it was shared like 15,000 times. And this is this post is about the end of uh, restrictions in the Czech Republic. So I don't even I can't even say that it's so particularly relevant for anything in Hungary, but still um, it, it went viral. And again, I don't know, it might have something to do with the algorithm. And again, this is uh, something we're learning about Facebook and doing this kind of research. It, it's a very, uh, very strict limitation that we have that it's so opaque. So that we, we don't know a lot of things. Okay. so. Um, what we saw in the top, what we saw in the top hundred posts is that in Hungary the government had a very widespread vaccination campaign, um, both on its own pages and political leaders' pages, and also on uh, public media pages, and uh, they had uh, two, um, like this. These were the top posts in both in November and in February. The uh, November one is urging people to get vaccinated, and uh, February one is about is, is giving information on how the vaccine certificate or the immunity certificate is uh, going to be changing, like what will what the new rules will be, and what we saw that in this get vaccinated uh, uh, discourse there were two narratives that emerged. Uh, the first one uh, was uh, you need to get vaccinated for social responsibility so that to, you can protect others and uh, to allow society to function so that we do not have to lock down, basically. So that was one argument. And the other one was to get, you need to get vaccinated to protect yourself. And um, uh, for example, this was part of the campaign. Uh, you can see it's uh, the prime minister's own page. He's saying uh, on the, the one on the left, he's saying that only the vaccine protects you. And uh, the middle one is about, is from the, 
public media. And again, he's saying that you need to get vaccinated. And uh, the third one is also vaccine saves lives, go and vaccinate yours, get vaccinated. So these, but these were the two. Um, then uh, we also, also saw a lot of I think we, we've lost the connection to Judith or. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. I, I don't know what happened. I'm really, really sorry. Um, so uh, where was I? Mm. Um, okay, so um, so um. Okay, so uh, where was it? Yes, so we also had uh, um, two major uh, narratives uh, when it came to protest against mandatory vaccinations. One was uh, um, around uh, about negative social consequences. So basically, these narratives were saying that this narrative was saying that uh, if vaccination is made mandatory for teachers, then we won't have enough teachers because they will quit instead of taking the vaccines. And the second one was, uh, was similar to the Romanian narrative. It was uh, framing the vaccination as an issue of personal liberty. And uh, this is, uh, in the sense it's, it's different uh, from uh, the Romanian data. And I think it's because of the mandatory vaccination is that in Hungary, the discourse was really not about uh, vaccination such, but again, about mandatory vaccinations. So maybe that is why we didn't see or very few, there were very few posts in the qualitative data uh, that uh, uh, were about the negative uh, health consequences about, of the vaccine that, uh, are dominant in a lot of disinformation discourse. discourse. So we, we hardly saw that. And I think that's why the, the Hungarian context gives you the answer why, or one of the potential answers. And also a very different uh, finding is that we had a surprisingly low number of examples of conspiracy theories and disinformation in the, um, in the qualitative data. And I think it might be due to the methodology because CrowdTangle, as we know, only captures public posts or public groups. And it's possible that uh, the hardcore disinformation narratives are being spread in private groups. And also the conspiracy theorists are uh, very often develop their own special language, both in terms of real language. For example, they have a word for people who who supposedly having been injured by the vaccine. And we didn't use those keywords. We wanted to capture the more general narratives. And also they use uh, these codes for, for their content to trick the algorithm. So you see how they spell COVID. Um, so that that is also possible that simply um, CrowdTangle didn't capture these posts for us. And also it's possible that the disinformation groups are sm smaller in Hungary and their individual, even though they active, they, their individual posts cannot compete with the more mainstream uh, pages and posts. And uh, all, in fact, the vast majority of uh, disinformation that we, we saw were spread by mainstream politicians who uh, were for MPs then or MP, MPs now. And again, this is linked to the general elections that were coming up. And the radical right party, Mihazank, totally used uh, the COVID uh, narrative to, to gain votes. And they uh, launched this campaign against the COVID dictatorship. And um, so that was another narrative that was pushed, but it was uh, sort of limited to them. So I'm going to stop here now because I think we're running out of time. So. Uh, if you have any questions, then uh, let me know.
Thank you. Thank you, Judith, for your presentation and for presenting us the results from Hungary. So yes, uh, now we have a session of uh, questions. So if uh, any questions, remarks to our speakers, our team members, please, you can address them now. Done. Done. Yes. Uh, so, first of all, uh, I want to congratulate everybody for this because I, I imagine this is, wasn't simple and uh, having uh, the task to to uh, work with uh, this large set number of data it's uh, it's quite a challenge. And uh, from my point of view, I think you you you've done a very very good uh, good job. Uh, I have uh, just a few um, uh, minor observations and uh, um, maybe some type of suggestions and uh, some very small questions. And um, first of all, uh, I came back to what uh, Judith said at the end of the presentation, and uh, I think she's right regarding the uh, words that you included in the, the a Boolean search that you used for this uh, this topic. Um, he, I could imagine that if you could include a lot of other uh, uh, words, you've uh, you you could have uh, um, extracted more conspiratorial content. But uh, uh, this is something that can be improved in uh, in the future. Uh, from our experience, this is an iterative process. You put a, a list of words, you will see what you extract, and then maybe uh, knowing some conspiratorial pages, you look more in depth into that pages and see other words to include, and so on. Um, second, uh, I have a very small. Um, um, terminology um, observation that comes from my background as a political scientist uh, uh, regarding the Romanian presentation about uh, um, the involvement of uh, political parties. I, I've heard a lot of references about right-wing party. And uh, from my personal opinion, and not only my personal opinion, a lot of other political scientists that are uh, and uh, analyzing the activity of this new party in Romania is not right wing, it's extreme right wing, or uh, I don't know, radical right wing, because uh, um, we have classic right wing and left wing, and we, we don't need to to, uh, to confound them. And uh, this is important because in all your mentions regarding that party was uh, labeled as, uh, that party was labeled as right wing, and it's a little more than that from my opinion. Uh, third, um, I agree with your uh, evaluation regarding the use of sentiment analysis. It's usually uh, uh, very um, controversial in, uh, in, in uh, right now in literature and uh, people are avoiding using it uh, right now because of a lot of complications and uh, uh, trying to use what Krautengal uh, uh, is offering you, the um, emojis, uh, probably could work as a better idea. But uh, as Judith said, you need to contextualize that. And if, uh, obviously, you cannot compare uh, the, the hate from uh, news with hate from a uh, uh, politician. And, uh, but it's a good idea to try to explore, uh, to explore that and see if it makes sense or not. And um, my, um, uh, my last observation is regarding to what uh, Judith uh, remarked uh, for uh, Hungarian data. And I think this can uh, be found also for Romanian data when compare page, uh, pages and groups. Uh, in, in our experience, uh, also the groups in Romania have 
has the lower numbers of uh, engagement than pages. Uh, not only mainstream pages, but classic pages. Usually groups are uh, um, have that, uh, the, that type of uh, uh, results. I know CrowdTangle uh, is give, are giving you data uh, is giving you data uh, separately when you are creating search queries for groups and pages, but my suggestion would be to compare those uh, the data sets and see for the Romanian data to see uh, the impact of uh, public groups compared to the public pages, and I suppose you'll find out that like in Hungary they are less relevant. Uh, they are important, they are aggressive, but they are uh, less relevant than the mainstream. And uh, I, I've tried to, to look a little about uh, on Google Trends right now on, and comparing the search interest uh, in Romania to search interest in Hungary for vaccination and find out uh, that probably this can explain why uh, the number of data in Romania um, uh, is, is larger than the data set from Hungary. Uh, people in Romania were a little more interested in the in searching about the subject and uh, uh, this doesn't mean that we are much interested but probably means that we had a lot of uh, uh, i don't know um, it, it has to do a lot of, of, with that extreme right wing part in the uh, all the things that are happening in romania for the last two years and that's my observations. And uh, thank you, thank you again for uh, allowing me to participate to this uh, a very interesting project. Thank you, thank you for being part of this workshop. Um, if any questions from our participants or from our speakers, May I just uh, re react? Okay, so I think the Hungarian data is also are also a much smaller because we're a much smaller country. So you know, there's only nine and a half million people in Hungary, and uh, so I think it's it's, it's um, natural that uh, you get a lot smaller data set than than with a bigger language. And uh, regarding the keywords, I think what is really interesting is that we used, uh, I think, the same keywords in Romania and in Hungary, and still we got uh, much more conspiracy theories in Romania than in Hungary. So I think that that is really a fascinating um, and very interesting finding. So. If yeah. I may, if I may add on what Judith said, that's also what I wanted to, to point out that we discussed, we had a very long and heavy discussion in the beginning when selecting the keywords, because we knew that if you, we started finding kind of the main keywords that people uh, wanted to counteract the algorithm with, so different variants of spelling, vaccine, vaccination, so on, and we realized we were spiraling down kind of the fringe of the platform and that we would not get the general image that we wanted to tackle. And still, as Judith said, we still got a lot of those. So we do have in our data set from Romania, a lot of alternative usages of, uh, of all the vaccines, all the vaccinations. And I think that's, uh, that's interesting. And it's definitely one of our um, directions to for the research, at least in our Romanian data set, because it's clear that it is just the surface. We barely scratched it, indeed. So uh, that's that was also interesting. That is the main difference between our our data sets. Their uh, in their data set, people are more much less prone to to misinformation, from what I've seen. Yes, very interesting. Also, uh, what Roxana said: if you if we will to use only coded words. Maybe some biased outcome will be, or will, the result will be some bias in, in the end. So that's why the words were so neutral, I would say. If any questions from um, our participants? If not, I would say that um, I would like to thank all our team members and our guest speaker for joining us today for being part of this workshop. And um, I hope that this uh, meeting was useful and uh, provided some useful insights and some uh, information about the study, the methodology, this topic. So thank you all for joining us today. I hope you'll have a great end of the day. And again, thank you for being part of this workshop today. 
Goodbye. Thank you. And have a great uh, end of the day. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.